Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to do a little bit of exploration and uh, go and find the one place on the ship where you can see our keel. And we're going to talk a little bit about the different structures we find and, and features of the ship as we go down. As you can see, we're on second deck, just forward of cruise mass. So we're just aft of the chow serving line. The barbette for turret number three is right here. And you can tell we're at the aft end of the six inch thick armored deck because of this step right through the door. That, that is the end of the armor where it steps down to uh, regular sized metal. So we're going to go through the main armor deck and uh, talk about what we find on our way down. We're going to go through some of the shaft alleys and take you to the one place on the ship where you can see the keel. We've already gone through the shaft alleys and if you've watched that video, you may have inadvertently seen the keel, but we didn't know what it was at the time. Uh, anyway, Iowa class battleships have a triple bottom defense that uh, helps against explosions underwater. And the keel ends up between that. So it's normally out of sight, out of mind. But this one place, access to the shaft alleys, has the keel, uh, the aft end of the keel visible. So for those of you who don't know, the keel is basically the spine of the ship. It's the first thing that you begin construction with. You know, if you look at a Wikipedia article or read any book about a ship, it'll say uh, keel laid on this date. That's when construction officially starts. There's usually a ceremony. And uh, then they go from there. So we're going to find potentially one of the oldest parts of the ship. Uh, and as normal with our videos, the, the stuff we're going to see here is mostly off of the tour route. So stuff you can only see by slogging through these videos. Uh, where we are here on the chow serving line and uh, cruise mess is on the tour route. But as we go down this hatch to Marine Corps berthing and below, we're leaving the, uh, the tour route. So come along and watch your step here on the six inch hatch. Uh, so I feel like I talk about armor a lot, but for those of you who are just starting with the channel, armor is so heavy that you can't afford to armor your whole battleship. So Battleship New Jersey has an armored citadel, and that's where all the important stuff is. All of the magazines, all of the engineering spaces, um, anything like that is inside the armored citadel. Unimportant stuff, like cruise masts, the captain's cabin, most of the berthing spaces, are outside of the armored citadel. The theory is that if the rest of your unarmored ship is shot to pieces, you've got enough reserve of buoyancy here in the citadel that you can stay afloat and all of the critical functions, sailing and gunnery, to stay in the fight. Iowa-class battleships use a uh, multi-layered defense throughout their armor scheme. So we've got an inch and a half thick main deck above us, and then the six inch armored deck, and then a splinter deck below that. The idea here is the main deck will uh, set off high explosive bombs up there, so that it's only the shrapnel hitting the armored deck. And it will decap armor piercing explosives, bombs or shells coming in at a steep angle, so that by the time they hit the main armored deck, they're going to have a reduced effectiveness. Uh, and they probably won't be able to punch through the six inch class B armor. However, armor plating is brittle. So even though the shell will bounce off and explode harmlessly up here in the galley, um, you'll get what's called spalling which is basically splinters that break off of the inside of the armor from it being so brittle. So that's why beneath us, there is a super thin, super elastic, about five eighths of an inch thick um, splinter deck, which is designed to catch those splinters and bend rather than breaking or shattering and allowing those splinters through to the important stuff underneath. So I just talked about how the splinter deck is 30 inches below the armored deck. Well, that's true for all of the area between the gun turrets. It's not true when you come aft of turret three, which is where we're standing now. Turret three is there. Marine Corps berthing on the starboard side is through there. 
So also down here are a series of storage spaces and eventually magazines. And to form a splinter protection over those magazines, we have the deck here, which is approximately an inch or 25 millimeters thick special treatment steel. So that'll stop anything that punches through up above us. And these storage spaces are uh, crammed into the angles between the barbet, the side of the ship back through there, and uh, this bulkhead here. This is the aft armored bulkhead. So on Iowa and New Jersey, it's about 11 inches thick. On Missouri and Wisconsin, it's 14 inches thick. Back aft here, the armored bulkhead is only one story tall. And then, here you can see some of the structure that uh, mounts the deck to it. It uh, continues going that way. Instead of being the roof of third deck, it's now the roof of fourth deck or the floor of third deck. And it is a little bit thicker uh, at seven inches instead of six. And it covers all of the refrigeration spaces and aft steering. So that's the armored box around aft steering that uh, just also adds a little bit more buoyancy to the Citadel. Now obviously we can't go through there, so there's only one way to go down. And before we do that, you'll notice that uh, we've got a ladder and a ladder. They're both called ladders, but a more traditional stairway and a straight up vertical ladder. This hatch is for loading ammunition. The 16 inch magazines are beneath us for turret three. So uh, this ladder is just pinned in place, basically. The chain railing can be removed, the bolts or pins at the top and bottom can be removed, and then that's out of the way, and you can lower shells straight down. You've got a straight shot through the ship. Uh, and if in the process of loading shells, you also have to get some people down there, you've still got a ladder. So here we go. All right, so now we are on fourth deck in the same trunk. And let's just go through some of these uh, magazine spaces here because we probably won't come back here anytime soon. So uh, first off, really cool, the idea above my head. This is an original World War II globe type light fixture. There's a gasket in here. So this is more or less watertight. Um, so it can function even if the space is flooded or flooding. Uh, or because we're in the magazines, if that light bulb glass breaks and you still have an arc between your uh, filament in there, you're not gonna start any fires. So uh, there aren't too many of these around. Most of them were removed when they replaced the incandescent light bulbs with fluorescent fixtures. So that's a cool find. Uh, we've got the counterweight for the hatch overhead. All the hatches are supposed to be accessible by one person. So the fact that that's an inch thick of armor plate means it's a little heavy for that. So it's counterweighted and attached by a greased cable there. We'll go into those rooms in a minute, but first let's start this way. So this room, uh, we know for a couple of reasons that it has to be a magazine. So first off, there is a lock on the door. You see this box, you can put a lock in here, and nobody can use bolt cutters on it. When you come into this space, you can see that there is a chill water refrigeration system in the overheads, a chill water radiator, and then you've got the typical uh, magazine uh, storage brackets. In this instance, this would be the Marines Small Arms Ammunition Magazine. I'm not sure if it was always that, but by the 1980s with the Marines living directly ahead, above us on third deck, uh, a lot of these spaces around Terra 3 were converted to, or maybe they'd always been that way, but at the very least they were converted to uh, Marine Corps stores of various types. Also interesting here, you can see the radius of the barbette, uh, which now that we're inside the armored part of the ship has dropped down in thickness. And you can see this frame uh, you can't really weld the deck to the barbette. So you've got a, a frame here around the barbette. It's not attached uh, that you can mount all of your decks above too. And it's got to be pretty beefy because that is a one inch thick armored deck up there. So if we come back out of here, 
and close this door over here. So if you are following us uh, on your blueprints, here's where we are. The blueprints show this as an unassigned space. Well, there's no freaking thing as an unassigned space on a ship. If there's an empty room, somebody is gonna put stuff in it. And in the case of this space, it's not set up to be a magazine, although we do have a globe type fixture here. You can see the watertight gasket I was telling you about. They've done an authorized, unauthorized ship alt, and they've added a pipe here. So my guess is this space was taken over by the Mardet, their magazine's right there, and used for probably uniform storage. So maybe they hung all of their class A uniforms down here. There isn't really room for that sort of stuff in their lockers, and those have to be pressed and starched and whatnot, so you're not gonna fold them up somewhere. Uh, or potentially it's something like uh, their heavy coats, rain gear, some, something like that. Their uh, whatever pattern of M65 jackets they were being uh, authorized in the 80s. So some sort of uniform storage is my bet for this unauthorized space. So if you got your, mag your uh, blueprints printed out at home, scratch that out and write that right in uh, what actually was here. Or wait a little bit until our volunteer John Miano prints his book, which is going to show you the complete blueprints of the ship as she was at the end of her career with all of these unassigned spaces filled in. Now, let's head over to the other side. So behind me is the G4 division's uh, space. It's not a magazine. It doesn't have one of those lock boxes on the door. It doesn't have a uh, sprinkler system in the overhead. It does have more of that uh, support structure under the barbet. So uh, the gunnery divisions on board, G1 through 3 were the various 16-inch turrets. So G1 was turret 1, G3 was turret 3. Uh, G4 and 5 were the port and starboard 5-inch gun batteries. So they each have a storeroom. And since this isn't a magazine, it was probably spare parts, or it might have been personnel equipment, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so it seems like another unassigned space that the gunnery division claimed. Because these are magazines down here, um, and because we're beneath Marine Corps birthing, it makes sense that the various gunnery divisions or Marines would be claiming these spaces. And we come into this space, and we do have one of these lock boxes. Um, and we do have the chill water radiators in the overhead, so it is another magazine. And you can see the uh, storage area here. This is where all of the 50 caliber ammunition was stored. And it looks like in the 80s, the 50 cals were also manned by the G4 division. So maybe that space over there was spare parts for the 50 cals, and this was uh, where the actual ammunition was stored. Interestingly, when the 50 cals weren't mounted on deck, they were not stored in either of these spaces. We're not seeing the brackets for that. They must have been kept elsewhere. Oh, here's another interesting feature. A watchman's uh, key station. And this has just been through bolted into the door here. Uh, open that up, There's room in there for a key. When the ship was in mothballs, probably from 91 to 99, this would have been added so that whoever the watchman was who had to go around and inspect things uh, would have to we take something out of this and mark their checklist uh, saying that they were here or maybe this is where the key was to the locked door so they could stick their head in and make sure none of the plumbing was leaking or anything like that. Uh, so, so that is a vestige of the ship's mothball time prior to being turned into a museum. All right, so let's go down again, this time from fourth deck to fifth deck. Going through this door, you're in the annular space, and then through the next door into the base of turret three, where the powder handling takes place. Over here is the pyrotechnics locker. That is another fourth division storage space, and pyrotechnics would be things like uh, signal flares.
Interesting that it's a gunnery division in charge of that and not the signalmen. Uh, that's what that is. And then coming in through here, we have the 16 inch handling equipment storeroom. So here you can see uh, the various carts that are used for moving the 16 inch shells or the uh, aluminum canisters that would hold the powder bags. You can also see the brackets that the shells would be mounted in when they're being lowered. You can see the, the straps that would have been used. And in this uh, big triple wall box over here, we've got all of the uh, mounting brackets and hoists that would have gone on the various uh, rails around the ship, like this one in the overhead. Usually they're painted white, but the rails that are used to actually sling this stuff up and move it from space to space. This is interesting. Uh, there's also some hooks for grabbing things. Interestingly, this space does have the chilled water radiator system in the overhead. So it seems like it was originally set up to be a 16 inch magazine. And at some point they mounted these aluminum brackets, which notice they've got the uh, profile in them for the wheels for these carts to be mounted. Uh, these carts have been pulled out to be on the tour route. So you can actually see them in use with a shell or a powder canister on them, which is why they're empty. Uh, but at some point it was changed into the uh, handling equipment storeroom uh, from a magazine. So who knows where this stuff would have lived early on. They couldn't do it without it. And they definitely didn't make any of this stuff in the eighties. It's all original. Uh, so check out, uh, if, if you guys find some World War II booklet of general plans, go through it and see if you can find where this equipment would have been stored. So let's head down to sixth deck and we'll actually be in the shaft alleys. So now we're at the shaft alleys. Some of this stuff is going to duplicate that video. Um, you should definitely go back and watch that video if you haven't seen it yet, but we'll cover it briefly. First off, check out this beautiful watertight door. Look at all of this gearing here. It needs to be greased. Look at that mechanism. Great Depression era technology. And this door is uh, three inches thick, so the rest of the shaft alley stuff out there is not armored, but it seems like this bulkhead leading into uh, number two thrust bearing is. Why is that? Because propeller shaft goes through a gland seal in the back of the ship here and passes out into the ocean. So if that leaks and this space floods, you want a really good watertight bulkhead between yourself and the rest of the ship. So here is the number two thrust block. Uh, basically, this exists so that the uh, propeller biting into the water and pushing the ship forward is not just pushing the engine block forward a couple hundred feet uh, forward of us in the ship. It is transmitted into this thrust block which is bolted into the ship's structure so it is pushing the whole ship and not just its engine. Here we've got a coupling. So the propeller shaft is made in sections uh, and those sections can be taken apart if we need, if we suffer damage, we can take this apart. And let's see, we've got a pipe vise here, that's nice. Here we are in the bilges, bone dry, just like I like to see. But this is the aft gland seal. So this is stuffed with packing, and that would be changed periodically, usually in dry dock. And uh, if it doesn't get changed, then it starts to leak here into the bilge. And here you can see some of the uh, modern float switches that we have installed, where if this does leak, uh, obviously I don't come down here and inspect the space often, but if it does leak, well, then we get uh, a signal about it, 
and we can come down, inspect it, figure out what's going on. It's a nice old vise that's probably been down here all along. So where we actually want to go, we are on the starboard side of the ship, and number two thrust is the inboard one. So we want to go through that little door right there, uh, and I'm going to have to ride this shaft to get there. Ugh. Ooh, that's not attached. Ugh. All right. Oh. Grace, how did we do this last time? Feet first. Ugh. So the keel um, is essentially an I-beam that's about four feet tall. Down here, I'm standing on the bottom of that I-beam, uh, and that is part of the shell plating of the ship. It's about an inch thick. You can see where the shell plating going out to the starboard side is riveted right on top of it, and the next shell plate is riveted underneath and then they continue alternating like that. This center bulkhead forms the spine of the I-beam, and then this plate, I believe, is the tail end of the top of that keel plate, and you can see it continues right through here before going through that bulkhead and running about 800 feet forward. Uh, where it is inside of the triple bottom, and so inaccessible. And this area here is the only place where you can view it. It's mirrored on the opposite side. And you'll notice all of the walls and oval doors cut into them. Uh, these tanks, or really void spaces, um, do not have doors, they're not designed to be separately watertight. However, because this is holding the entire weight of the stern from the keel up, it's heavily subdivided with these uh, approximately half inch uh, steel bulkheads, which support all of the structure above it. Now, you're probably going to say, oh, but Ryan, the keel are on the sides of the outside of the ship. You can see them whenever you're in dry dock. So those are bilge keels, and they help stabilize the ship side to side uh, as she rocks. Those are not the actual keel, the spine of the ship, which has all of the load-bearing elements from when the ship is first built. Thank you guys for watching. We're not gonna keep you on film for our undignified escape from this void. So what's your favorite design element of the Iowa-class battleships? Let us know in the comment section down below. Do you think you could do a tank crawl like this? Or are you just living vicariously through us? Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, and also from other businesses and viewers like yourselves. And the support from you guys uh, is what has allowed us to make many of these videos. Prior to uh, your donations, we were only making one video a week, and now we create up to five videos a week. So if you would like to continue to support us so we can keep making this a larger part of our jobs, there's a link in the description below for ways you can donate. Also remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when new content goes up. Thanks for watching.